We uh, refer to John chapter 13 this morning. You can have your Bibles open if you like, or else you'll be able to read the scriptures as we move forward. But I'd like to just talk about supper times for a moment. How many of you have supper times together as a family? Very, look at that. That's really good. That's really good. The supper time or meal time is usually when, you know, families, they gather together and they unpack uh, their day's events, and we discover what's happening in each other's lives. At least that's the intent. On occasion, something unusual might happen at dinner time. I remember when my little brother, AJ, was four and a half years of age, he was in the process of chanting, Cookie Good For Me, because he was a Cookie Monster uh, fan, and right in the middle of his Cookie Good For Me, he fell asleep right in the play. <laughs> <laughs> Sound asleep. That was fun. I can remember Susie swatting Joe over the head with a celery stick. He still complains about that to this day and threatens to call children's services. But uh, there's, always a, there's often unusual things that happen at mealtime. You might wash back some milk and discover that it's close to being cheese. Uh, or you might discover that the sugar in your coffee is really salt. That has happened. Well, as we return to the adventures of the man Jesus called Simon Peter, we, I talked, we were following his adventures prior to Advent and up until Christmas, and we're returning to see what uh, he experienced and how the Lord grew him. But we discover that he, along with Jesus and his other friends, shared in more than one meal together. And on occasion, something unexpected would happen at one of those meals. What has come to be known as the Last Supper is the most well-known. It was a Passover meal, which was an annual occasion that Jewish people remembered their deliverance from the Egyptians, where the Jewish people, the Hebrew people, were made into slaves or servants. And the meal, the remembrance meal, uh, was designed to invoke remembrance. It was a dramatic meal with bitter herbs and dips, and it was designed to provoke remembrance and awe and worship, and so it was meant to be a meaningful time. But Peter could never have dreamt of the drama that Jesus would add to this Passover meal. He didn't know, of course, it was the last meal that they would share together. But there would be no falling asleep upon the plate. There would be no thrashing of celery over somebody's head as occurs in our home from time to time. <clears throat> but there would be enough, enough of the unexpected to make this the most memorable of all the meals that they shared together. It began with Jesus instructing Peter and another disciple, John, to get the whole thing ready. They were the ones called up to, to serve. They had to go out and bit, purchase bitter herbs, parsley, wine, and Kara said, not yet, we go back to the next slide please, the previous slide, there we go. They had to go out and pur purchase all these things, the Kara set, which was a mixture of ground apples, raisins and almonds, and cinnamon, it symbolized the mortar that the Hebrews had to mix when they uh, compelled them to build pyramids and other such projects. They had to go out, Peter and John, and, and locate a lamb that was spotless. It would be certified spotless by the local priest that they could serve for the Passover meal. As well, Peter and John had to be responsible for finding the, the room, the furnishings, and seeing that the table was set. And it seems altogether a little odd that Jesus asked Peter to do the serving, the meaningful task. After all, we've already established the fact that Peter kind of rose to be the leader amongst the disciples. And it's not often you ask the leader to do the menial tasks. They have other things that they need to do. I suspect that Peter was a little bothered by this request. Nevertheless, he did it. And Jesus, not one to make a statement or to make a decision or to make a request on a whim, there was something deliberate in him asking Peter to do this. Because at the end of the meal, he wanted to grow, he wanted to shape Peter in a very unique way. And so the meal begins. Some of you have witnessed food thrown at someone across the table, or you've seen cutlery thrown across the table. Never? Yeah. Yeah, okay. 
<laughs> I've seen cutlery, th cutlery thrown across the table at our house. Spoon whacked Rebecca right in the head one time. I won't tell you who did that. It wasn't me. <laughs> Nothing could prepare the disciples for what Jesus was about to put out there at this meal. Matthew tells us that Jesus began the meal by predicting that one of the twelve was going to betray him. And that's dramatic. And we can also reconstruct where some of the people were sitting at the table. We're told that John was sitting at one side of Jesus, and he was leaning in towards Jesus. And Jesus was leaning in towards the person sitting on the other side of him, which was Judas Iscariot. That's dramatic, because we're told that Jesus identifies Judas as the one who betrays him. Jesus is leaning into him, but having identified him as the betrayer, Judas departs into the night. It's all very dramatic. You can imagine the impact it has on the other eleven. The one person we can't place around the table in terms of where he's seated is Peter. Peter is there, of course, because he gestures towards John with a question as, who is it that is the one that betrays? So we know he's there, but we don't know where he's seated. It could be that he's up and about serving the others, but not likely because John is seated on the one side of Jesus. We may have thought that Peter would be the one in the place of the intimate friend where Judas was sitting. Remember, Jesus was leaning into Judas. That's the place of the intimate friend. We would have thought by virtue of their history together that that's where Peter would be seated. But not on this occasion. And I wonder, and with good meaning, if Peter had his nose out of joint because of this. Because of what follows, we suspect that Peter was a little out of sorts. Luke tells us at the end of the meal, an argument broke out as to who was the greatest among them. Who do you think might have been in the mood for an argument? about who's the greatest. At the end of the meal, Jesus silently rises from his place. He moves towards stone water jars, typically used for washing hands before the meal. He wraps a towel around his waist. He fills the basin with water. It's all very dramatic. What is he doing now? They're wondering. And if you look closely at the story of what is usually referred to as the washing of the disciples' feet, you will soon discover that it's actually the washing of Peter's feet. No one else's. Peter's feet. And once again, Peter is front and center because it is Peter who was obligated to serve the dinner. It was Peter who was not seated next to Jesus as he would have hoped. And it was Peter who needed to learn what it means to truly be great. Jesus, the rabbi, their teacher, the one who they have come to believe is the Messiah, the anointed one, has poised himself now as a servant. And according to Jewish tradition at the time of Jesus, too many people were elevating in their in human esteem the role of a rabbi. It was coming very close to, to worship idol worship. And so a rule was in place that no student, no disciple could loosen the sandals of their rabbi. No student, no disciple could put themselves in such a position to honor a rabbi to the extent where they would actually bow down at their feet, let alone touch the feet. It was a limitation placed on servanthood to avoid the zealous praise of, of human teachers. And this must have been on the mind of John the Baptist when he said to Jesus, I'm not even worthy to loosen his sandals. He's making reference to an expected culture cue, cultural cue back then. But further to this, the, this underscores just how dramatic it was for, for Jesus to not only insist on loosening Peter's sandal, but washing his feet. For the rabbi to say, I'm going to do this to you. That was amplifying how inappropriate it was.
And you can understand why Peter flipped out and he said, no, you won't do that. Because Peter was right in his own eyes according to the culture of the day. According to the customs of the day, it was extremely inappropriate for Jesus to be touching Peter's feet, let alone Jesus to be touching Peter's feet. In fact, of all the inappropriate things to be doing, this was the most inappropriate of them all. You have to understand that to get into the emotional dynamic of the story, to realize that what Jesus was doing was so outside the line, so outside the box, that it was inconceivable. And Peter says, no, you will not do that. As I said, Peter's the only disciple to ever say no to Jesus. A little brazen. But he was convinced he was right. But there was something far more important to Jesus than honoring cultural cues. And that was molding Peter into the person that he was intended to be. And Jesus sets an example to Peter, and he sets an example to each of us that we should follow. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing. And he didn't. But later you will understand. No, said Peter. You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. You see, Peter's denial is serious business. In fact, Jesus hinges everything upon it, his salvation, his discipleship, everything. Unless I wash your feet, you have, you have nothing to do with me. Hindsight's 2020. We know that Jesus came to serve, not to be served, and to set an example for us to follow in his steps. Unless each of us can saddle up to this, we miss the good news altogether. And Peter, the ever passionate and all or nothing kind of person, he responds. Then, Lord, not just my feet, but wash my hands and my head as well. <clears throat> Doesn't matter what Peter's doing, he's doing it with all. all. All his heart, all his energy, all his passion. He's all in or he's not in at all. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you. Now we can sit back as we... Reflect on this, and we can say about Peter, what a goof. One, for saying no to Jesus. <coughs> Secondly, for then saying, well then give me a bath to, from head to toe. Yeah. How foolish. But it was this characteristic of Peter that he was all or nothing. He was all in or not in at all. That Jesus loved about him. It's the attitude, if I have to serve, I'm going to do it wholeheartedly and without reservation. It's a great attitude. And I have here a continuum that shows the servant scale. And on the extreme, a true servant is one who gives. The one who does not serve is a taker. Are you a giver or a taker? Jesus said as an example that we should follow in his steps. Greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friend. That is the quintessential description of a servant. Someone who's willing to give all for their friend. Where are you on that continuum? Are you a blend of a giver and a taker? A true servant is someone who, like Peter, will become an individual who gives with all their heart but not before Jesus would do it first upon the cross. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. That's what we are called to do. It's that kind of radical Christianity that we are called, called to that will impact this world. And Luke tells us after the argument amongst the disciples about who's going to be the greatest, the catalyst being Peter because his nose is out of joint, he's been the one asked to serve the table, he's the one who's been... Uh, removed from the privilege of sitting at the, at the place of the intimate friend beside Jesus. So after the argument and after the foot washing lesson, Jesus sums up the lesson and servanthood with these words. Next slide. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? 
Is it not the one who is at the table? But Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves. See, Peter becomes a stone that rocks the world primarily because he learns the lesson that if you are going to be great in the eyes of God, it becomes by being a servant through and through. That you are not a taker, but you are a giver. Later years, Peter, the one who argued about who was the greatest, was able to look back on those moments, probably with embarrassment, but he had learned his lesson, <coughs> the shape of his life had changed. And this is the counsel he gave to other Christians. I'll just read you a few excerpts from his letters to other Christians in, in uh, First and Second Peter. Second Peter, verse 1, his very first words, Simon Peter, how does he describe himself? A servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. How many of you, if you were to introduce yourself to someone else, would go, Hello, my name is Lori Little, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. How can I serve you? That's how Peter introduced himself. He had become a servant. 1 Peter 4.10 Each of you should use whatever gift you have received. Why? To serve others. For Peter, he had grown into a servant. He wasn't that at first, but he became that. None of you, be, Peter talks to shepherds, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them. Not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve. A pastor, not to be served, but to serve. May it always be so. I have some questions for you. What will the shape of your life look like? going to be a giver, or are you going to be a taker? What are you now? And if you are a giver, to what extent will you give till it hurts? And I'm not talking about dollars here, that, that might be part of it, I'm talking about Coping with inconvenience to be there for others. To give of yourself, your energy, your time, and your resources. To what extent? See, because we're either building the kingdom of God, or we're building the kingdom of Diane, Ken, Doug, Jim, Jim, or You're building a kingdom, but whose are you building? Do you see yourself as a servant or one to be served? That's the Christian life, folks. It's right there. I've wanted to use this. <laughs> I always forget. It's right there. servants. Servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not as men pleasers, but as ones who are doing the will of God from our hearts. May our business cards say, servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. Make it so.